culture with worldviews which once would have been considered inconceivable but are now considered honorable, a small voice cries out in the wilderness. A voice which is unwilling to surrender to the demands or the madness of the woke culture. This voice may be small and yet it holds great power. Power that cannot be weighed on the scales of a godless culture, but power that will nonetheless stand the test of time, because it is the truth. Welcome, pilgrims, to the Pugnacious Pilgrim Podcast. We are glad you are here with us today, and we are hopeful that you will walk away informed, enriched, and equipped to live as pilgrims in a brave new world. Mike, uh, Merry Week Before Christmas Week. Uh, Jason. Eve. How are we doing, man? I am doing well. How That's are you good. doing? I, I'm doing good, dude. It's a good day. Uh, good. We're, we're, we're flowing into this uh, Christmas season on a high note, I think. Um, yep. My wife has influenza A. Yeah. And so does my daughter. So, Rats. booyah. Uh, but but myself not, and and two COVID. of our childrens, yes, that's true. It's yeah. not COVID. Uh, I, and I guess I don't know. Maybe the celebration is that the flu is back this year because last year it was like there was no such thing as the flu, right? Yeah. I mean, it was not here. So I'm, I don't know. I mean, I'm not like stoked that that my wife has the flu, but I guess I am happy it wasn't COVID. I think that means yeah. we don't have to quarantine uh, 14 days. We have to quarantine long enough where people don't like get the flu from us. Yet I am here. Yeah, and you came of your own accord. I mean, I you were aware of the, of the scenario that you were walking into. We got a job to do. Yeah. Well. Yeah. This you, podcast isn't going to do itself. You you, you know? had you you had two jobs to do if I if I remember correct, right? Like you also uh, didn't you also help my grandma move? I did. Yeah, and that was tonight. Yeah, that was today. Yeah, well, thanks for that. I know she was grateful. Uh, I was too, because I would have had to move all that stuff on my own. So I'm thankful that I didn't have to do that. But I'm just glad that I have people in my life that find me useful. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, I mean, that's that's a big deal. You know, I think that's one thing that scares me about being old is that you know eventually I'm gonna become not useful. <laughs> being old. Yeah, and and when I when you're not useful, like. You know, especially because we'll be communists by then, won't we? Well, yeah, all More signs point to yes. <laughs> so once we're communist and no longer useful, I mean, that's like to the glue factory for yeah. the horse, right? I mean, that, right. that's how it ends up. We're both up. trying to grow Karl Marx beards. Yes. So, I mean, it's only a matter of time, right? I was going for Spurgeon or even potentially uh, Calvin, but I mean, Marx, no. I, I could fit in with the <laughs> Marxist. Yeah. Except, oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of the transgendered women, uh, maybe with the exception of Sonny and Cher's kid, uh, still can't grow very good beards. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, the Marxists are going to look a little different than than John Marx probably anticipated. But probably, yeah, they're going to have some pretty funky hair. Yeah. 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 Well, Merry Christmas uh, to our Merry pilgrims. Christmas. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Uh, you know, we got a we got an interesting uh, podcast lined up uh, tonight. It's we're we're kind of just going to have a conversation, sort of like we did around Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm excited about it. Um, yeah, I mean it's 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 the Christmas season, Mike. You know, tis the season, right? Yeah, it's the season uh, when Jesus was born, right? <laughs> um, not, not exactly, but, but I think I know what you're going with there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just, I just wanted to throw that out there because, you know, there are a lot of people who are like pretty nominal Christians that are like, man, I, we just need to remember that Jesus was born. This is Jesus's birthday. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, hang on a second. You know, yes, it is a day that we remember that Jesus yeah. was, was born, yeah. but you know, historically speaking, Jesus was probably born sometime in the spring, right. maybe around like March. We don't really know. Right. So I don't know. I just, I don't know why I think that's important to clarify, but for whatever reason. I mean, you want to get it go. right. It's kind of like yeah. the, you know, the three wise men showing up at the manger scene like that didn't happen, you know, and, and I, I get why they try and smash it all together because every kid yeah. needs a part in, in the Christmas program. Right. right. But uh, it's not exactly biblical and i think you know i mean when you play loosey-goosey you know even with things at that level it it changes people's uh, understanding of reality yeah yeah like i saw um i think it was a babylon b article or no it was a not the b article that was talking about some people that were like ruining 
Santa for a bunch of kids. And I commented on it and I was just like, can you remind me again, like where Santa fits into trying to like <laughs> raise Christian children? Like I, I'm really not trying to be a Scrooge. I'm just, I guess I'm confused as to like why this is like the worst thing in the world that somebody's like ruining the whole Santa thing. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, St. Nick is a true historical figure, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and but St. Nick and Santa yeah, aren't I'm, really the same thing. They're like something, they're like two things that have been like mashed together. Right. Yeah. And, and again, like we, we, we often talk about other people's podcasts on our podcast, which probably isn't super great for this podcast when we're actually telling you what you guys should really listen to. Uh, but there is a podcast uh, out there called Red Pilled America, and they did a great uh, story on, you know, the history of Santa Claus, if yeah. you will, and how it really is a, an American thing, right? And yeah. it's, it's you know, like everything else, it's kind of made its way to other parts of the world uh, because of America, but it, it is rooted in American capitalism 100%, yeah. right? Uh, you know, the, the, the story and history of St. Nicholas is pretty cool. Cause he actually, yeah, yeah. you know, he like literally punched a guy in the face, uh, for denying that Jesus always <laughs> existed. So that, that part of St. Nicholas, I, I do appreciate, but, uh, yeah, symbolically that that's not the Santa Claus that we see today <laughs> really. Right. So I don't know. I, you know, I guess I'm just kind of a contrarian at heart yeah so you know i don't have decorations up at my house i just i just don't you know mm -hmm. i don't have a tree up at my house it's probably also because i'm single but uh you know i'd probably put them up if i had a wife that was like hey you know it'd be really nice to have decorations but what's really important to me during this time is to not like be a heretic yeah <laughs> yeah that's cool i mean i think I, <laughs> you know I, to like make the important thing the important thing like yes yeah. jesus should be the reason for the season right. but let's not let's not just like be extra christian during the month of december like yeah. that's just super weird to me right yeah. it's like when people are like during easter right which why do we call it easter but during easter they'll be like especially christian be like we got to go to church i'm like well where have you been like the other you know 51 right. weeks of the year so you know maybe i'm just a little bit bitter but i just you know i really wish people that people including myself would take their faith more seriously and actually you know jesus isn't just like a tradition you right. know it's he he's more than that correct so and we're going to talk about that tonight. So that's a great lead in for us. Uh, we appreciate uh, that, that segue that you, that you gave. That wasn't even part of it. Uh, you did bring up the fact that you're single. Uh, I do feel like it is my responsibility as the co-host of the show. Uh, last week, there were a couple um, instances where you showed, showed your muscle uh, on camera, which, you know, we got a good chuckle out of that, but, but some of our listeners, um, I, I don't want to say they weren't impressed because I mean, by all ways to measure this they must have been very impressed because there was a couple guys who uh mentioned that their wives uh, accidentally walked by while they while they were watching the podcast and yeah stopped and kind of did a double take so we've been asked kindly to not allow that to happen again so i appreciate you being a little bit more wearing long um, sleeves yeah, today covering up the yeah. pythons yeah and my my response to that is uh is do you even lift, bro? <laughs> <laughs> that, which is a little bit better than than the 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 feedback that you gave me about five minutes before the show. I thought your your initial one was a little bit more humorous, uh, you know. Uh, and I don't know if I should say. We it don't or have not. to go there. There's some to. things that are left off the air for oh, a really? reason. Okay, all right. Well, well, if you want to know, um, you know, maybe we could at the new year we can start maybe a subscription <laughs> service and people can pay for for that kind of information. Oh but. yeah, for sure. Uh, speaking of which, uh, you know, again, we're not a hundred percent behind the capitalism that Christmas has become, but if you are, we at least want to let you know that we do have some merch ourselves, uh, that would make great Christmas presents. Um, I pitched to a couple guys that I'm in a Bible study with, uh, weekly, uh, the God is judgmental t-shirts and they were actually pretty thrilled about it. And two out of three of them said, I want one of those. Uh, and so we want to let you know that you can actually purchase those. So if you if you go to the Pugnacious Pilgrim uh, website, which is PugnaciousPilgrim.com, uh, you will actually find uh, right at the top bar there, uh, 
the pugnacious pill or the pugnacious shop is what it's called okay. and if you go to our pugnacious shop you'll find things like our coffee mug you'll find things like our sticker we even have sweatpants mike you and i are not sweatpant guys but we know that there are sweatpant guys out there and uh we we want you know our, we want to try to cater to yeah are the hats still on the website the hats are on the website are you right. talking about the nice ones yeah. Uh, I don't think so currently. So those are not, but they okay. ne- they need to be. Well, you can buy sweatpants. Though. Exactly. You can buy sweatpants. Um, all of our gear is white and blue or black and white. Yeah. Uh, except for the sweatpants, because if yeah, you're gonna you buy, can it, choose. Yeah, your you own can color. Choose. Uh, we we kind of staged them as red because we want you to be flagged. Like if you are a person that's wearing sweatpants, like you should stick out. And um, if you listen to this podcast and you don't want to wear our logo. Um, on the lower half of your body, why are you even here? Right. I mean, what's you know? the point <laughs> exactly? Uh, that that's the point. I mean, there's yeah. a reason that. Like, are you po- even really a fan? Yeah. Do you even lift, bro? Is really <laughs> maybe what you, what you could say. In I that should scenario. get some of those sweatpants <laughs> and just exclusively lift in them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the gear is there. Uh, you would make a lot of Christmas dreams come true and and we will yeah. say uh that every time uh, a, a purchase for the pugnacious pilgrim is made an angel gets its wings and so um you know uh or it's, something it's like especially that. important for us not to be heretical during the christmas <laughs> during the christmas season so. okay i guess it's only only when a bell <laughs> rings uh, does an angel get its wings yep. but all right. Well, uh, you know, um, our show is really just geared around the idea of Christ and how he did change the world, Mike. And so we, we really want to break it into, um, you know, four different things. We're going to speak of the topic of love and peace and hope and joy. Uh, and, and Christ is so much more than that. We know, I mean, we've been talking about it. He's also judgmental. Uh, but but specifically, we want to hone in on these four things and these four attributes of God. And not only that, but but how did Christ bring those things? And And then, you know, it's very easy, at least for me, from my perspective, to see that the world is also craving all four of these things oh, and, yeah. and chasing them uh, to, to the ends of the earth. Yep. Um, but they only truly come through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to really kind of spend uh, the majority of tonight um, looking at Luke 2. Uh, but before we do that, um, you know, we, we also want to be able to fit in culturally uh, with with the rest of the world. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and play. Uh, this is a clip that that actually was put together by uh, Todd Friel back before Wretched Radio existed. Before this was Wretched before Radio. Wretched Radio. So this was uh, what what did he have before that? I think it was tied in with the uh, Way of the Master. Um, and I don't know if it was called Way of the Master Radio or not. I guess not. I'm not sure. I love but, Todd Friel. Yeah, though. I mean he's a he's a stand up guy. I mean I, yeah. I, I he's definitely stood the test of time. His delivery takes a little getting used yeah. to. But did, did you know he was uh, like before he got saved he was a stand up comedian? Did I you did, know that? I did know yeah, that. And, yeah, and I mean so he he fits that persona quite well. He really does. Yeah, yeah he comes off a little bit condescending sometimes. Yeah, but I think a lot of his content is like totally spot on. Right. And I, you know, I've had a similar conversation um, with a significant person in my life who may or may not be my wife uh, that, uh, <laughs> you know, she, she, some of that delivery, right. The sarcasm yeah. and, and kind of the curt to the point. Oh man. I know all about that. Trust me. Yeah. That's yeah. Um, but, you know, it works. It it cuts Sometimes, through. It cuts through. You, yeah. you, you got to know your audience, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and sometimes just a good curt message uh, is important. But but what we're gonna deliver here, courtesy of uh, Todd Friel, uh, is is something very different than a curt, sarcastic uh, response. And so enjoy this. Uh, it's worth the listen. And Joseph went up from Galilee to Bethlehem with Mary, his espoused wife, who was great with child. And she brought forth a son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And the angel of the Lord spoke to the shepherds and said, I bring you tidings of great joy. Unto you is born a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 
There's a problem with this angel, said a Pharisee who happened to be strolling by the stable. As he explained to Joseph, angels are widely regarded as religious symbols, and the stable was on public property where such symbols were not allowed to land or even hover. Besides, said the Pharisee, there are no such things as angels, and telling a child that they're real will only hinder the child's emotional development. And I have to tell you, the whole thing looks very much like a nativity scene. That's a no-no, too. Joseph had a bright idea. What if I put a couple of reindeer over there near the ox and donkey? He said, eager to avoid sectarian strife. Just to clinch it, throw in a candy cane and a couple of elves and snowmen, too. No court can resist that. Now, Mary asked, What does my son's birth have to do with snowmen? No persons, cried a young woman, changing the subject before it veered dangerously toward religion. With the arrival of the three wise men, someone gasped. They're all male, not very multicultural. Uh, Belthazar here is black, said one of the magi. Yeah, but how many are gay or disabled? A committee was quickly formed to find an impoverished lesbian wise person among the lame of Bethlehem. Thankfully, a calm voice said, Be of good cheer, Mary. You have done well, and your son will change the world. At last, a sane person, Mary thought. She turned to see a radiant and confident female face. The woman spoke again. There is one thing, though. Religious holidays are important. But can't we learn to celebrate them in ways that unite, not divide? For instance, instead of all this business about Gloria in a Chelsea's Deo, why not just season's greetings? Mary said, You mean my son has entered human history to deliver the message, Hello, it's winter? That's harsh, Mary, said the woman. Remember, your son could make it big in midwinter festivals if he doesn't push the religion thing too far. Centuries from now, in nations yet unborn, people will give each other pricey gifts and have big office parties on his birthday. That's not chopped liver. One of the shepherds called out from the back of the crowd. The prophet Micah wrote that out of Bethlehem will come a ruler to shepherd God's people. And that's just a myth, said the head of the prophet seminar who had just arrived with his committee. We scholars have determined that the prophets actually said very little of what they are credited with saying. And everything they reportedly said about a Messiah was added years later by other writers. How did you determine that? We cast lots. And Mary took Joseph's hand and said... <sighs> Joseph, tell me again what the angel Gabriel said to you about our son. Squeezing her hand, Joseph answered, He said that we should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Mary looked down at her son and sighed deeply and then said to no one in particular, I wonder if they'll let him. The end. So good, dude. I I mean, I love that. I mean, culturally, that that's where we are. Yeah, are what not? was it? A comment they found like an impoverished lesbian wise person. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, there's no gay or disabled people here. Where are oh, they? Man. Yeah, I mean, uh, that that's the world in which we live. Uh, you know that that all inclusive uh, message is necessary in order to uh, basically remove all credibility and uh, significance yeah. from from the story that literally should have changed the world and did i mean did change the world yes yeah i've always thought it was kind of silly like the fight between people who say merry christmas and the people who say happy holidays yeah like that's just a silly fight to engage in right you know uh mostly because i don't i don't care if you find merry christmas offensive um but i'm also not gonna go like out of my way just to make somebody angry angry yeah you know like somebody who gets triggered about that like they're already they're already in need of a heart transformation from the Holy spirit. Like you triggering them is not going to be the thing that, that softens their heart. Right. You know? Um, but at the same time, why, like, why is that the battle people choose? You know, like gay marriage gets voted into legality, but they're like, we're going to keep saying Merry Christmas. Darn it. You know, like, why'd you choose Merry Christmas? You're not taking that away too. Yeah, I mean, why why was that the hill? Yeah, that why you were was that the on? hill that you yeah. that you were willing to die on? But you're you're letting the country like literally fall apart and have you know all of our traditions and laws like completely adulterated. Yeah, yeah, you know. So I don't know. I think that's goofy, but I I certainly understand the point that Todd Friel is making here, and it it still stands today. If if this was something he made a while oh, ago, yeah, this is probably maybe fifteen years 
old or more uh yeah. I, you know i think the thing that that sticks out to me is that again like there there's a way that you can tell a story that removes all of its significance importance and you can you can you you can make the you can make the word of god benign you can yeah. make the word of god uh lose all of its cut lose all of its importance lose all of its significance and then you can wrap it in a bow and say hey it's still the christmas story it's still right. the message and you're like no ac- actually it's not yeah you know what's crazy is when i was 21 and i was finally like my heart was softening to the lord right like i remember specifically and we don't have to go into my whole testimony, but I remember the moment I was standing in a church. Well, it wasn't even a church. It was like an arena mm-hmm. and a church service was going on in the arena. And I just remember that feeling of like just letting the light through the crack just a little yeah. bit, you yeah. know. And uh, what it, what happened is it led to a conversation with a guy who wanted to talk to me about Jesus. And he gave me the gospel message. And I was 21 years old. So 21 years of Christmases. And I had never heard the gospel message. I had heard the nativity. Yeah. You know, I had heard that Jesus was born. I had, I I knew what Jesus, I I knew what happened. I didn't know why though. Nobody had told me why 21 years and nobody told me why it was significant. Yeah. And, and how, how will they know unless they're told, you know what I mean? Like it, it blew my mind. And, you know, he, he opened it up for questions and I, I thought I had some, man, I thought I was like this super amazing atheist, the amazing atheist, right? Yeah. That has like, dude, I know more about the Bible than you do. And turns out like I, I didn't at all, no more than he did. Um, but I guess my point there is like, let's not, let's not be casual, right know. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, you know, really what we want to try and get at kind of like we did with Thanksgiving, right? Is that it's an opportunity. What, what Christmas provides Christians is really an opportunity to engage culture, uh, with, with eternally significant things, right? Yeah. Like you had gone 21 years, not knowing the most important information that you could have ever known, right? Yeah. And some of it was by choice, right? By your own hard heart and your rejection of, For sure. you know, but at the same point, like th- that's alarming. That's sad. And you're, that's not a unique story. Like that's not the exception like that. That's the rule. Right. And so I think that, uh, you know, what we want to encourage our listeners uh, to, to know is like, take advantage of the situations that God gives you, right? Like we pray for open doors. We pray for our family, especially mm-hmm. those that don't know the Lord. And then, you know, like, hey, God is opening a door. Every single Christmas, there is a door that's open. You know, one thing that, that even continues to get me to this day is, you know, you'll hear the greats like Frank Sinatra and even even modern day, you know, singers sing these Christian songs on, on the radio. And it's like yeah. on Cool 108 or whatever, like they're singing the gospel. And my heart just breaks because it's like, dude, do they even know what they're singing? You know? Well, they're, yeah, pretty sure Clay Aiken has right. you know a, a christmas album right at least he's on like american idol yeah. christmas albums and he's singing these gospel messages right. you know and living an openly homosexual lifestyle and it happens over and over and yep. over and over again i mean oh man yeah it's it is hard to listen to i got really into this band called the pentatonics and they're yeah. like an acapella group yep. or whatever i've heard of them and they have these amazing christmas songs but again like half the half the group is homosexual you know and i would excuse me i'm like getting burpy from this <laughs> this mountain dew but i would imagine that uh they are not believing the words that they're singing yeah and i guess you know the 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 prayer would be you know like lord help them know yeah. what they're singing like open their eyes right and and to me what's cool about it is you know, most people would, would know a lot of these Christmas songs and maybe even sing them because, you know, Mariah Carey did, and I love to sing to her jams or whatever, you know, but you know, those are all open doors of opportunity that we have to say, Hey, do you, do you really understand the words that you're singing? Right. Like after I got saved, man, like the little drummer boy, like that messed me up. (laughs) You know what I mean? 
like such uh such a like under the radar song yeah once you understand what the actual meaning of the song is it's like whoa like this is a really this is actually a really deep song yeah yep you know yeah. and it, it carries a lot of weight and people just play it in the background while the family gets together because it's christmas music yeah, one song I try, and I, I appreciate the Little Drummer Boy too, you know, one song that I try to avoid at all costs, and, and maybe it just shows my callous heart, but but the Christmas Shoes song, dude, that that's just a little over the top. Do I know that one? I'm not sure if you do, but it's it's a little boy whose mom is dying, uh, and so he goes to a local store with his $9.36 oh. and, and tries to buy a, a pair of shoes for his mom so that she can put them on when she goes to meet Jesus. And it, it tears at the heartstrings, um, which I don't like, because I got, like, one feeling left, and, and I don't like people messing with that that much. But, um, you know, one thing, like, I'll turn it off when it comes on the radio, but I always tell myself, like, you know, it's not a real Christmas song. Yeah. They made, like, a Hallmark movie out of it, so I don't feel totally bad. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I get that <laughs> for sure. Uh, but before we derail too much, uh, you know, let, let's jump into this topic. Uh, you know, that, that was the, the Christmas story retold, uh, to be a little bit more politically correct, but we're actually going to jump into the real Christmas story as told, uh, in the gospel of Luke. Um, and so, uh, I'll read, do you have it? If you don't, I'll, I'll pull it up. The gospel um, of Luke. Yeah. It's, two? Uh, it's Luke two. Yep. And we're basically going to read, um, I mean, really, we could read the whole chapter. I I don't think it's it's too much. Um, I think it'd be a great table setter for where we're trying to go. Oh, and, my goodness. I just had it. And then we'll uh, just pick it apart because there's, uh, you know, again, we're we're focusing on love, joy, peace, Luke and hope. Luke 2 has 52 verses. It does. You it, want me it, to read it? Yeah. All right. The birth of Jesus Christ. Luke 2, starting with verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in swaddling, is it cloths? Clothes, cloths. Swaddling cloths. And laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for I be, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, 
Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the, Lord, the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people, Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their town or to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. I think that's good. That's good. And, and you know, next it'll go, you know, when they bring the boy to the, you know, bring Jesus to the temple. Yeah. Uh, for the feast. But, you know, there there's so much there uh, in, in Luke. I love the gospel of Luke and just his recounting, um, you know, the really the way that he tells the birth of Christ and, and really the death of Christ to me, I mean, this dude knew how to tell a story. Um, yeah. and I, I, I don't, I mean, we want to be a truth based show, facts based show. Um, I believe that Luke was the one that actually had some medical, uh, you know, background. And so, you know, a lot of his details are more, you know, spe spe specific to like the body and, and, you know, just things that are detail oriented. Yeah. And, you know, you can tell uh, that and it's just a, it's a different narrative. Um, a lot of people ask, well, why, why do we need four gospels? You know, they're all telling pretty much the same story, right? But you get the personality of the authors in them. And really, yeah. not only are they, you know, corroborating each other, but they're also, you know, giving different angles, different perspectives uh, of the same thing. And Yeah, it, and they're not all covering the same exact exactly, events. Yep. There are different parables and yep. different gospels. Um, you know, it's just like if you send four people to a seminar, they're yeah. all going to come back with something different, but exactly. they all saw the same thing. Yep. So... And, and that's, that's crucial, right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes you pick up, you know, different things from different people and, and it just hits you differently, you know, even how you're wired as a person, right? And, you know, a lot of times people say, well, uh, you know, obviously there's contradiction in the Bible. Look at how Mark and Matthew, and it's like, dude, you're, you're missing the point. You know, you're, yeah. you're looking to argue uh, uh, for the sake of trying to, you know, really cast out on something right. and really what this is is an invitation to turn to jesus right yeah like, turn that, to christ that reminds me there's uh there's a thing called the skeptics annotated bible mm -hmm. where some skeptic i guess went through and annotated the entire bible of like every um contradiction quote unquote contradiction right. it made which really what it means is uh i don't understand what this right what the author's saying. Yeah, the yeah. author is just saying, or the, the guy who did the, the annotations is just saying, I don't understand this, so it must be right. wrong. Uh, there was a Christian who went through the entire Skeptics Annotated Bible and annotated all of the annotations right. to prove, like, none of this is a contradiction if you actually have some comprehension skills. Yeah. Um, and well, I think it's, like, net or something like that. But it's, it's really fascinating. And... Um, I, I guess the reason I say that is just because I found that early on in my faith to be a really great um, resource 
when speaking with people who are obsessed with the idea that the Bible contradicts itself, right. especially when you're talking about like between the Gospels, because people will be like, oh, well, this guy says two people were there and this guy says one person was there. It's like you yeah. can't have two if you didn't have one. You know? Yeah. Like, you just... Well, not only that, but I mean, it's a difference in like literary style. Right. Exactly. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. And and, uh, you know, I, I agree with all that. There's there's great tools that are out there. Yeah. You know, I think to me, you know, I, I used to get uh, involved in a lot of those debates and not that yeah, they don't, don't bear anymore. any fruit because I think they can. Right. There are some people that are legitimately skeptics by nature. Right. And they need they need detail. They want that. Right. They want truth. And, and I think the Bible is true. Right. So it can stand on its own. We don't have to apologize for it and we don't have to pretend uh, yeah. that that, you know, so I think there is a, g- a good time and a good place and even a good reason for for some of that. Um, but really you know, like don't, don't miss the forest for the trees. Right. And, uh, so I, you know, what we want to pull out of there specifically, right. Like I want to kind of hit on these attributes, right. And love and, and hope and peace and joy, they're all rooted in this, this story. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think again, like we, we talked about how the world just desires, uh, truth. The world desires freedom. The world desires hope and joy and peace. We, we know that, right? Um, and, and it is here. It has come. God had promised it from the very beginning. I think last week or a couple weeks ago when we dove through uh, Genesis, we were talking about the patriarchy. Was that last week? Yeah, that was Man, last week. It feels like a long time ago. But, but we went back to Genesis 3 and we showed the curse that, that occurred because of uh, sin entering into the world and God's perfect design and God's perfect world that he had given to humanity was destroyed by our own choices, right? But he also made a promise and that promise is being fulfilled uh, in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so when when you look at uh, someone's telling you nice Christmas lights. That's coming from inside this house. So uh, thank you. We decorate uh, to the best of our ability. So uh, I wish we knew an interior designer because I think... Yeah, um, that'd they, be great. Yeah, that'd be great. So if anyone knows any interior designers that could help us out with some ambiance around here, we'd love that. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, why did they go to Bethlehem, right? Like, Mary and Joseph, uh, we know their story, right? We know that Mary was with child. That's what this says. We also know that that child uh, was not Joseph's. Uh, he did not put his seed there. Uh, his his virgin wife was pregnant uh, before he was with her. And not only that, but the the Lord, uh, act- the angel of the Lord actually told Joseph that he could not be with her until the child was born, right? Yeah. And so uh, here we have a, a young um, betrothed couple uh, going to Bethlehem because they're of the city of David and, and uh, a decree went out, you know, basically a census and they had to travel to the, to their, you know, homeland, if you will. And so um, uh, then, you know, while they're there, uh, the time came for her to give birth and she gave birth to Jesus and she wrap, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in the manger because there wasn't a place for him in the end. That's something that I I think we overlook, right? We know that, you know, we always, oh, we got the shepherds and we got the sheep and we got the cow and we got our manger scene, isn't it? It looks so great on my, on my table or on my, Right, you know. but it wasn't arranged like that. No, like that. And, and, and not only was it not arranged like that, but like what king enters the world in that way? You know what I mean? Yeah. And the answer is clearly the king who's coming to be a servant, the king yeah. who's coming to turn the whole thing upside down, the king who's who's becoming, stepping down from his well, he's throne He's turning of glory. everything right side up. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, upside down in our own minds, yeah. right? The way right. that we think of kingdoms and the way that we think of rulers and, and that kind of stuff. Right. I now I got the burps too. I don't know. <laughs> should we blame the Mountain Dew? We should blame the Mountain okay, Dew. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. Uh yeah, usually we're sipping whiskey, but uh <laughs> so so that's something that, that just sticks out right out of the gate is, you know, this this is a if if someone was going to tell this story and try and make it up and try and make it believable 
and try and make it something that would gain people's attention just for the sake of selling them on something, it, the story wouldn't start like this. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, I mean, look at the modern day Jews, right? They they reject Christ. And one of their talking points is that the Messiah never would have come like this. Like the, one of their points is th- this is not what the Messiah is right. going to look like. The Messiah is a king. The Messiah is not going to come riding on a donkey. The Messiah is not going to be born in a stable. Right. The Messiah is going to be a king. He's yep. going to be a powerful king, you know, adorned Throne in David, riches. Yeah. And like, we're going to know that he's the king and mm-hmm. all of that stuff. And that's, that's not how Jesus right. was born. And it, and it did and yeah. does still lead to a lot of rejection, right? Because we, we want things on our terms, right? So, you know, God did make a promise and he was, he was faithful to that promise. I mean, I'm in, I'm in uh, first Kings right now in my, in my daily uh, studies. And, and I just read today about, you know, how Solomon uh, took over the throne from uh, David after his 40 year reign. And, you know, even the wisest man that has ever lived, right? The, the Bible literally describes him as the wisest man, and there will never be anyone that will be as wise as him. We see that he is still cursed, cursed with the same curse that we hold, which is our sin, right? And and the wages of our sin, if we give it uh, room to grow, it, it breeds corruption. It leads to death. And that's exactly what happened to Solomon. You know, he embraced foreign wives, um, and because of that, and because of the idolatry that they brought in and, and his, uh, rejecting God as the one true Lord, even, even by allowing them to sacrifice in these temples to, you know, Molech and some of these other idols, right? Like it, it literally took the kingdom from him. Yep. You know, he, he was able to, through the promise of God, God remained faithful to his covenant and allowed him to, uh, remain uh, a king and then passed on one kingdom, you know, uh, one tribe under him, but it split the kingdom, right? Yeah. And I, I guess the point that, you know, I'm trying to make in all this is that there there is no, uh, you know, our efforts as humans are to pave the way for how God has to function and how God has to work. And we build these ideas of what it must look like, right? Because we know best, and God constantly shows us, no, that's not the way it's going to work. Yeah. We're going to do it my way. You know, th- this is how life works, right? Yep. Yeah. And that's why one of my favorite prayers recently is, Lord, please humble us. Please. Because even in our pursuit of God, well, I, especially in our pursuit of God, uh, and I'll just speak for myself. I tend to think that I have it all figured out and I know how God's going to move in a certain ca- case or area. Mm-hmm. And then it just, it doesn't happen. And then like everything falls apart from my perspective. And then in hindsight, I can look back and be like, wow, God really did move like yeah. a lot. And it really taught me something about my expectations and and about me trying to fit God into this idea of what I think God's character would look like or what I think God's behaviors would look like. It, God just isn't able to be predicted like that. Yeah. He's God. He he knows more than we do. Right. <laughs> he and knows he knows beyond our knowledge. And he so. knows best, right? Yeah, and, exactly. And, and we're going to get, you know, as we, you know, dissect this story a little bit further down, there's two people that were waiting for the Messiah, right, in the temple. And, and both of these people, when they saw Jesus, they knew exactly who he was. And they had been waiting for him their whole lives, right? Uh, mm-hmm. We just want to clarify, I guess we didn't give the disclaimer that not all foreign wives are bad. So I'll, I'll go ahead and say it because... Uh, Apparently, uh, we're, we're offending some uh, with our with our. <laughs> hey, just read the Old Testament. <laughs> right. It, it was his foreign wives that led to uh, his downfall. Yeah. Uh, and and you can take that for what it's worth. Uh, we know specifically what that, the word of God, that God, says. God God told him not to marry. Uh, you know, outside of Israel, and he chose not only to marry outside of Israel, but also to have a uh, friends with benefits relationship yeah. with about three hundred others or 700 others it, it was a grand total of like a thousand women he was he was up there like wilt chamberlain like i mean they probably were in a running for uh most dates <laughs> ever but anyway i mean Dang. 
<laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize you were going to go down that path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't either. Um, so uh, moving on, th- one of my favorite encounters in all of the Christmas story, Mike, is uh, is the shepherds. You know, yeah. again, if, if you were going to pick a people group to uh, reveal the good news to first, it would not have been the shepherds. Um, I loved how our pastor said it this past Sunday, Pastor Matt, which I think you're you're probably going to end up hearing this sermon, I think, this Sunday. Yep. So I don't want to yep. give too much away. But, you know, he talked about the shepherds being somewhat untrustworthy dudes, like um, a bit shady, right? Because they would bring the sheep wherever they went. And they would oftentimes feed off of other people's land just because there was grass and food available, right? And they they weren't uh, thought of in very high regard, right? And yet uh, the the news, really, the good news came to them first, right, through, through yeah. the angels. And uh, so I, I think that that's so cool. Um, uh, and the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. I try to think about, you know, uh, imagine, right, the skies opening up and just seeing, you know, the the angels of the Lord. And, I mean, I'd be afraid too, you know. Yeah. Uh, would you quake at the sight? I, I think I would. Uh, I think just I would too. Mainly for, you know, I would want to be a part of some decent lyrics that would last a long time. But uh, the angel said to them, fear not. And, and it's like, dude, why, why would we not fear? And, and this is the, this is the great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fear not. Why? For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger and suddenly there was an angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And so I want to dissect that a little bit. You know, the good news is what? What is the good news, Mike? Well, I mean, well, I mean, to paraphrase. Yeah, I mean, paraphrase. Like what? Yeah, yeah. the good news is that the Savior is born. Right. A savior that what? They, I mean, how long had the world been waiting for this savior? Since the fall. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, there there was obviously like different stages of understanding, mm-hmm. right? Like the first we understood that we were fallen. Then we understood that um, that reconciliation with God was something that we couldn't attain on our own. And then we understood that there would be a savior. So I don't know. I don't know how long the period was before the prophets had prophesied that there would be a savior, and then the savior came. Thousand years, couple thousand years, yeah. something like that. But it had been a long time, right? And they were waiting for a very long time, yeah, right? Actively I mean, waiting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there was there was an extended period of darkness really mm-hmm. where the prophets hadn't spoke, right? I mean, the prophets mm-hmm. had not spoke since since the last prophets of the Old Testament, right? And so Which the, I think was 400 years. Yeah, 400 years. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, you know, John the Baptist really was the first voice that came in, in the wilderness and, yeah. and began to pave the way for the new Messiah. But this this was good news for for uh, the entire world, right? And and that's what it goes to say is that that I bring you good news of great joy, right? For all the people, right? And so we're we're talking about um, you know, the attributes of God, which is love and joy and peace and hope. Uh, the reason that that there is joy is that there is good news. Yep. God is coming. To earth, God has come. He is fulfilling his promise. We have waited for this day for eternity, really, for for them. For as long as humanity has been around, they have waited for this good news of great joy. And it's for all the people. And I think that people to go to church that that normally wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So uh, throw the invite out there. Uh, Just quick aside. You know how I like to tell my stories, right? So... Uh, at our church, I had uh, talked to the worship director 
about my sister and I both singing together at um, at our Prior Lake campus. Mm-hmm. We've never sang together on stage at the church we're attending, which is strange because I was asked to go to one campus. My sister ended up being at another campus. Yeah, I want to sing with my sister, man. Like <laughs> I love my sister. She's got a great voice. I think it's like the coolest thing that she and I have both come to know the Lord after growing up in like, I mean, I don't want to say that we were completely non-religious, but like we were pretty non-religious, sure. you know, um, like we didn't go to church or anything like that. And I, I don't think my dad who listens to this podcast would disagree with that at all. Um, but so I, I'm all excited about this, but it cuts into our family's Christmas Eve time a little bit. Yeah. And I'm getting excited. I'm like, let's invite them all. Yep. Let's invite them all to come to church, and then we can go and do our Christmas Eve stuff all together after we just went to a, a Christmas Eve service. And my mom, like, didn't even want to ask anybody. She thought it was, like, just a pain. Gonna put them out. And I'm like, this is, like, the best opportunity ever to just get the whole family to come to church because they'll all come and see me and Jenna. Right. They'll come just for that reason, right? Like yeah. you say, go to church and they'll say, oh yeah, Mike and Jenna are right. saying sure. You and know? all the people that are coming to Christmas because all of, like the half of my family that is like super obsessed with uh, <laughs> fear mongering, yeah. uh, they don't come to family gatherings anymore. So pretty much the people who show up, they are professing Christians that would not at all be offended by the yeah. idea of coming to church as a family. Right. And, um, I got really excited about the idea of maybe starting a new tradition and even my mom and sorry, mom, she but shot you down a little bit, <laughs> you know, and I don't think that she necessarily thought it was a bad idea, yeah. but it, it just totally broke the norm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Tradition, so like, yeah. yeah, broke the tradition. Like the comfort just like, isn't there. Yeah. And, uh, I don't think that she did it intentionally. Yeah. She just kind of saw it as like, ah, that's not what we do. Right. You know, but, um, and, and I think, you know, there's a lot of people like that, right? Like yeah. we can go through the motions and, and we did a, you know, we did a, a, one of our podcasts on traditions, right? And there's nothing wrong with traditions, right? But sometimes traditions yeah. can actually keep us from the good thing, right? Yeah. Traditions and, become an idol. Right. And not only that, but they become a distract. They can't, even if they're not an idol, they can definitely become a distraction from what is most important, right? Yeah. And, and so that, that's what I would make the appeal for right now as we're talking about joy and we're talking about hope and we're talking about, you know, really love and peace. Like there is good news for all people. Yeah. It's not just people who know Jesus already. This is good news for everybody. This is the news that the world had waited for, even though much of the world probably didn't even know they were waiting for it. The shepherds, you know, in the field, were they waiting for it? No, they were shepherding sheep, right? I mean, they weren't they weren't staring at the sky waiting for angels to show up, but the angels burst in because Jesus Christ burst into the world. And when Jesus came, it literally changed everything. Mm -hmm. And that is the point. That is why it is good news for all people. And so the angels went on to praise with the shepherds, uh, Jesus. And, And of course, you know, culturally, uh, you know, we have a lot of cultural Christians today, right? Even in America, right? Yeah. I, I was reading something that, that the pandemic has had an effect on people's willingness to call themselves a Christians or to even go to church anymore. And so we know that our culture is shifting, our culture is changing, but there is still an opportunity for us to press into the cultural Christianity that does exist and make the best use of that. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, try to the best of our abilities to be the messengers, right? Like we don't transform hearts. We don't convict hearts. We don't soften hearts. But our job is to uh, bring the message of hope, much like the angels did here. And then, you know, let 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 the Lord do what the Lord does, right? Yeah, yeah. And bringing the message of hope is important, in my opinion. Like, I love apologetics in general but like a lot of our fight is kind of with cultural christians sure yeah because we want christ to be represented rightly well, because yeah. when when christ is being represented incorrectly it makes christ look bad yeah you know and then people look at the christians and then they say well i, w- I wouldn't ever want to follow a god yeah. that looks like, like that? this yeah. in people um but 
you shared something from a pastor today that I think hit the nail on the head and it was Tim Keller. And I, I don't know a lot about Tim Keller. Um, I know I've heard some good things and some bad things, Yeah. but uh, what he said was if Christianity is really true, it will be offending and correcting you somewhere. And part of sharing the good news of great joy is you will come across people that don't like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I don't like it. M- much of the things yeah. that, you know, uh, we had a good friend of ours that actually chimed in and said, actually, it'll be, uh, w- offending and correcting you a, a lot of places like yeah. everywhere. Right. And, and, um, yeah, sorry to cut you off, but yeah, no, I, and I guess my train of thought with that is that we, we want to spread this message of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, um, because that is what love is, right? But sometimes it, sometimes there's pushback. Yeah. Right? Because uh, when, we, when we learn about Jesus, and even in, uh, even in Luke 2, when, you know, they're talking about like a sort of division and all that stuff, you're you're gonna come across these um, these potentially painful moments when when trying to spread love right. and joy and peace, um, but it is always for our benefit, right? When we are spreading the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, and I and I also I also think it's always good news, right? It's like, always yeah. You know, the the good news and we've talked about this a little bit, but the good news holds most significance when we understand the bad news, right? When we yeah. understand that the wages of sin is death, right? Right. Uh when if the best thing that we have to look forward to is the is the 80 years that we have on this earth, my heart grieves for all of us. Yep. There, there's no joy in that, right? Yeah. I mean, you see it in in every situation. It doesn't matter if you have endless amounts of money, like like uh, I don't know why he, he's uh, who who's the Amazon guy, Bezos. Yeah, Jeff Bezos, right? Like he, his his marriage literally just fell apart two years ago. Yeah. And part of that was because he was chasing some new woman, right? And eventually, that's gonna wear off, right? Like if she was willing to cheat on him, you know. Uh, you know, yeah. at that time, or he was, you know, what you know, the the point is, like, there's no fullness of joy in anything that this world can offer. There's despair, even the things that seem like the most appealing, even the the things that we crave and we wake up and we think about, right? If they're not Jesus, they will fail us. If they're not Jesus, they will fall short of what God has in store for us in the joy of Christ, and so. That is why the news that the angels brought to the shepherds was not only good news, but it was good news of great joy. And it's good news of great joy that is for all the people. And so don't cut people out just because you're afraid of how they may respond, right? Because like you said, right, you live 21 years of your life ignorant to the reality of Jesus in in a real sense, right? Yeah. When you know, who knows, right? If yeah, someone could I, I have brought that news to you in a, in a... Yeah, I don't know if I... I mean, I can't look back and say what would have happened right. if because the it's Holy Spirit rescued yeah, me. That's for sure, what happened. For sure. But the start of that was somebody inviting me to a church service I didn't want to go to. Mm-hmm. But even though I didn't want to go to it, I still ended up there. Right. Right, because, you know, who guides the footsteps? Yeah. The, who is it? Yeah, the Lord. Exactly. So ask. Yep. Yeah. Be intentional. <laughs> yeah. You know, take advantage of the opportunities that are given to you. Uh, you know, it, it goes on and says, you know, that, you know, the angels, when they sang their song, right, which is taking place in verse 14, it says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now, that part, I think, is wonderful, too, right, because God does bring peace but it's also uh, there's a caveat there, right? There's a, there's a disclaimer of who that peace is for, right? The the joy and the good news uh, is for all the people, right? Yeah. But but here specifically, this peace on earth is among those with what? 
with whom with his, whom he is well yeah well with whom he is pleased yeah there's not peace for everyone yep. there's not peace for all the people there's peace among yep. those with whom he is pleased and that's significant so how can you ensure that you are one of those people with whom he is pleased I mean, the Bible makes it clear that we turn to Jesus in repentance, right? Like John the Baptist's message is repent for the kingdom is at hand. Like that, that is what he came to do. He came to pave the way in the wilderness, the voice crying out in mm-hmm. the wilderness, like, you know, and, and his message was repent, turn from your wickedness, turn from your sin, turn from your selfish lifestyle, turn from that. Mm-hmm. All these things that you are pursuing love and hope and peace and joy in that are breaking you, that are continuing to, to ensnare you in the bondage of sin, turn from that. Repent and turn towards your Savior. He's here. That's how we do it. That's how we please the Lord. We please the Lord by coming humbly, submitting before him, uh, acknowledging who he is, acknowledging what he's done for us, mm-hmm. and then repenting and walking in obedience and newness of life. So... In what you just said, you insinuated that there are other ways that people might be pursuing this love and joy Mm -hmm. and peace. Um, What might that look like if somebody doesn't have the Lord in their hearts? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but but I mean... Just as an example. Yeah. Because, and and I I know where I want to go with this, because... um, it's very clear to me that in the human heart, there is a, a hole that is the size of God. Yeah. That you cannot fill that hole with anything yeah. other than the worship of the creator. Right. But we are constantly trying to fill that hole with everything else, right? With, uh, with fleshly desires. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the way that I wanted to go with that just really quickly is um at least in my generation drugs Mm -hmm. food um relationships with people right people are looking for anything that they can look at for happiness or they can look at it for to, to feel complete right so you know we have we have rates of drinking and getting high and you know addiction to uh all forms of entertainment Mm -hmm. uh the internet we're we're all addicted to dopamine you know what i mean so um i guess i just wanted to throw those out as examples of things that happen when you are not letting your fulfillment come from the lord and i'm saying that as somebody who's totally guilty right you know yeah, um, I mean, I, I think I, I, I know I'm guilty yeah. too, right? I, I chase those things daily and I, I we, we have to have this posture of repentance that's like, no, Lord, I'm going to turn from that. You are my prize. You yeah. are my treasure. And, and you know, Mark uh, Mark 8.36 is, is a verse that, that's fairly well known, but it, it basically it says, you know, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul, right? And, and that's really... You know, that's really, I think, at the crux of what you're trying to get at, right, is that we chase all these things. And they, you know, for some people, they settle for that type of joy. They settle for a life of promiscuity or or doing whatever, you know, food for the body, right? The body is food, food for the body, body, food, right? Like whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever I see that I want, I have, right? There's people that live that way. And yet, let's say they get 80 years on this earth. Let's say they get 120 years, right? When they die, they have eternity separated from the fullness of joy, yeah. separated from heaven, separated from God. You know, that, that there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing on this earth that this earth can provide that, that would ever offer any, any inkling of eternal satisfaction, joy, hope, peace, right? Yeah. And so... You know, I I had a thought that was kind of, you know, around this idea, right, about, you know, on whom his favor rests, right? The goal of Christianity is not to say that I made it, but rather to say I've been remade. Salvation is about freedom 
freedom from the guilt and slavery to sin, freedom to walk as a new creation into the abundant life of glorifying God and fully enjoying him forever. That is what Christianity is about. That is what salvation is for. It's not about joining some elite club. Right. The the point of what Christ brought is that he brought reconciliation with the Father. He brought a severed relationship that was severed because of our sin. He he paid the price that we deserved on the cross. He died in our place. He came as a man to live as the new Adam. He came as a man, born a baby, grew up, and and gave his life that he had on earth to live a perfect life to show us how we too can walk in obedience, how we can live in an obedient way that glorifies God. And then he died the death that we deserve because of our sin. And because of that, when we turn to him, when we put our faith and our hope and our trust in his finished work on the cross, we are new creations. And so how how do we please God? You know, we please God by letting God be our God. Yep. Not only our Savior, we've talked about this, but also our Lord, the one that tells us, no, this is how you live. I know your culture and your flesh and your sin nature want you to live this way, but I say don't live that way because that's idolatry. That's adultery. That's sin. Live this way instead. And not only will you honor God, whom we should honor, but we also get to live in the fullness of joy that he had for us all along in his presence. And that's that's how we please God. That is good news of great joy. A- absolutely. Because it it comes with a promise. It comes with a promise, right? Turn to the Lord, turn away from your sin, and the promise will be fulfilled. In you know, in the in the fullness of who Jesus was, um how he came to earth, how he left the earth, um, and, and the entirety of his ministry, really. Right. So these these are not just empty words. And for no. the longest time, it took me, man, it, I, I still wrestle with it as, as a Christian. And again, I've only been a Christian for, what, eight years? But it's, it's been in eight years of trying to really fully grasp the, the weight of, of of what is being promised to me because i i still search after i i still run after those sinful things that promise me what jesus has promised me right and you know there's there's a reason why jesus used the language like i am the bread of life yeah because we crave bread yeah right yep and he's saying eat from me and you will never go hungry right you know and Oh, man, I just, I I pray that that any doubt would would leave my heart forever, that I would just trust in the Lord in that. But it's it's a daily thing right. where and, and you have to continually crucify your flesh, yes. and say, no, I'm going to believe in the promise that the Lord has given me today. Yeah, and I think too, you know, we don't have to walk in condemnation, right? Yeah. And and that's one of the reasons that we have peace, right? Because those that don't have peace with God, they don't get a walk in the freedom of not being guilty. They don't get a walk in the freedom of not having condemnation, but we do, right? Because we understand, wait, Christ has already paid for that. That sin that I just chose to commit in my sin nature, in my stupidity, in my uh, selfishness. Christ paid for that. Now, what is the step that I need to do? Do I have to go be unclean for seven days and then come back and have a priest check me over before I can walk in newness of life? No, I don't. I now get to walk in freedom of right now. I get to walk in freedom. Yeah. The freedom is already mine because Christ purchased it for me. That's why there's peace. There's peace with God. Now, that doesn't mean that we sin and and we just have peace with God and we just continue to choose sin and that we're going to be at peace. We know that's not true, right? right? Like Christians we, don't do that, by the way. Don't no that that's that's not, yeah. And there are scriptures that that very clearly say what the consequences are if you if if you are treating uh, the the sacrifice of Jesus mm-hmm, in that way. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but it is a common topic that comes up with non-believers of like, oh, well, whatever, you know, I'll just live my life. And, you know, Jesus died for me. So like, I'm good, man. I'm good, bro. Um, right. I, I live a life of sin, but they've been paid for. So right. whatever. And, and should, you know, and, and Paul addressed that specifically. Oh, right? yeah, should, should I sin more that grace may abound? Heavens no, right? Like, right. of course we don't, because that is blasphemy. That yep. is blasphemy. That is rejecting the point and the purpose of the gospel. The gospel is, it, it's not a do-over card, right? We don't have, you know, we don't have righteousness that now is somehow infused into us and now we get to walk, you know, with our original sin gone and don't sin anymore. No, we live with in, imputed righteousness, meaning that Christ paid our penalty uh, but he offers us newness of life. He yeah. offers us a new heart. We are a new creation. And so the old has passed away and the new has come, right? And so our desire should change. That's one of the ways that we yep. work out our salvation, right? Because if I crave sin just as readily as I have always craved it, you know, like I need to truly go to the Lord and repent because sin over time, as the Lord is working in my heart, should be a bitter, offer, awful flavor in my mouth. And Your when sin it, should disgust it you. It should. Yeah. And, and one reason, even for Christians, that sin doesn't disgust us is because we don't know God enough. We're not spending the kind of time that we should in his word. We're not spending the kind of time that we should fellowshipping with him. We're being totally uh, saturated by a culture and a world that hates God. And and I don't say that flippantly. I'm not trying to make this about us versus them, but just turn on Netflix. Just turn on the TV. Turn on Dances with the Stars. Whatever it is, Go on right? Facebook. Yeah, you don't have to look very hard to yeah. find a culture that doesn't want anything to do with God or anything that God's about, which is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and self-control. Th- those are the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. The, those are not the fruits that are growing all around us, right? No, and, I mean you can you can seek to have, and I know this from personal experience. You can seek to have the most G-rated experience on the internet ever. Yeah, and you'll be scrolling through your Facebook news feed, and all of a sudden there will be a completely unrelated ad to anything you've looked at all day or talked about all day. That's just like almost pornographic, yeah, enticing you towards sin. And you're, you're just like. Do I have to lock myself in a box? Like, you know, but that's the culture we live in. Yes. You know, the, and, that's the algorithm. That's right. what the internet wants to do. That's what Satan wants. Right. Satan is prowling around like a lion looking for his next victim to devour. Right. And we're, we're told that. Yeah. He's not, right? he's not looking for you to live uh, in abundance of joy. He's not looking for you to live without condemnation. He's right. not looking for you to live... In, in peace and harmony with God. He's looking right. to destroy all of that. Actively. Actively. Yeah, he's he's not just waiting for you to slip up. He's actively trying to make you slip up. Right. And, and, and the only way to combat that is through a fervent um, desire and action to, to spend more time with the Lord directly. Right. So. And, and I was talking with a good friend, uh, you know, at, at my weekly Bible study, and he, he was talking about this person that he was speaking with who was depressed and, you know, just not feeling great and just feeling like uh, they didn't have a lot of motivation and life just was going poorly and they were just kind of almost feeling sorry for themselves. And he said, how much time do you spend with the Lord? And this person said, well, you know, I, I get uh, a verse of the day on my phone. And he said, okay, well, how long does that take you to, to go through? Like, you know, 10 minutes? And this person was like, no, probably about about a minute. And he's like, okay, so you spend a minute with God. How much time do you spend praying? Well, you know, probably, you know, I pray every night before I go to bed. So let's let's give it five to 10 minutes. So of your entire day, 1,440 minutes, whatever it is in a 24-hour day, right? Mm-hmm. You're spending six minutes of those 1,440 intentionally seeking Jesus. Yeah. And the rest doing what? You know what I'm saying? And I can relate with that, man. And, and I certainly can yeah. too. But but that I guess that's the point is that we will be 
influenced by how we choose to spend our time. We will be influenced by how we choose to spend our thoughts, right? And if life isn't going well, we do need to evaluate what am I doing with my life? Uh, We got a question from Neil that said, what are your guys' thoughts on fastings? I'm not, do you know what he's getting at with that? I mean, fasting. Yeah. So fasting yeah. in general is a, is a great spiritual discipline to it's try a and great set way to your, spend time with the Lord. Yeah. And to, to try and set your heart right. Like yeah. I, I don't practice it enough. Um, uh, sometimes inadvertently, uh, you know, my eating habits are bad, <laughs> but you know, yeah. fasting from things like Facebook or fasting intentionally from things that are distracting us from God and pouring that time and that energy and those thoughts and that effort instead into things yeah. that we know are going to bear spiritual f- fruit is, is a great way to, to rejuvenate our lives and, and yeah. once again, just grasp the greatness and the glory of God. You know, it's, it's, I agree with you. And I, I don't mean to take away from what you just said because I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> um, and I'm also a big fan of fasting. Um, I have done it. I don't do it nearly as often as I should. But it's interesting to me that Neil is asking what our opinion on it is <laughs> because I would love to actually hear what he has to say about yeah. it as well. Uh, knowing his experience and being a shepherd of his church. Um, and, oh man, I, like, I look at some of these things that, that we are called to do as Christians and fasting is one of those things that we're called to do that, like, man, how many Christians do you know that fast? And we're like, we're called to do it. Right. You know, it's, it's like advice given to us. And it's like, when you fast is what Paul says. Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, even myself, I have fasted, but I know a lot of Christians who have never done it. Right. And um, I think that needs to change. It, that's just my opinion, of course. Um, but I do think that there's a scriptural argument for it as well. For sure. Um, the discipline of fasting and learning how to fully rely on the Lord. When you're fasting, you have no choice but to, to lean on God and yeah. sp- actively spend time with him in the temptation to eat or whatever it is you're fasting from, you have to spend that time in prayer. Otherwise your fast is going to end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you do find out in those moments that, that his grace is sufficient. Right. And, and I think about Christ, even when he was in the desert and he was praying and he was fasting, right. Satan came to him in his most, uh, probably, in one of his weakest moments, right? Yeah. And offered him the world, right? Yeah. And you can't just not do something, right? It's not just a, a choice to not do something, right? right. Inst- it, you know, like Lent is like, well, we're not going to do this, right? Well, <laughs> what are you going to do instead? You know, like yeah. that. that is equally important. It's not just about giving up something. It's also using that time and energy and effort to pour into the things that we ought to be doing anyway, right? Yeah. And if Christ would have just been hungry and like waiting in the desert for his, you know, 40 days to be up or whatever. Right. And not, you know, again, this is hypothetical, but he he, he was with the Father. He was fellowshipping. Yes. He was in the Word. He knew the Word. He was meditating on the Word. So when the enemy came to him in his most in his one of his weakest moments, he could go back to the enemy and pour truth into the situation, right? Yep. And say and and literally say, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of the Lord, right? Like yeah. God is our strength. God if is our refuge. God is taking care of yeah. us. Yeah. Man, Neil with the tough questions. Like I'm yeah. just sitting here feeling convicted now because over the last two years I have set forth to fast man countless times and it's it's never gone past like you know 24 hours yeah and um i'm not saying that that's not like a legitimate yeah it is or anything (laughs) like that but especially um, from pop tarts it's just convicting to me because i know i have fasted for longer and i know that when i set out to fast i usually set out to fast for quite a bit longer um and it weighs on my heart when i break my fast and i know that it wasn't because the fast was over it was because i was at the end of my faith you know what i'm saying yeah so uh, man that's yeah that's that's a practice that um that that i 
feel especially convicted to uh, participate in more often. And it sounds like Neil has a ministry he's working on. So yeah, and and he he, he said, I guess I'm not fasting in secret here, uh, but I'll keep quiet in my day to day. But but you know, even then, right? The point of fasting is not that. Oh my gosh, look how great you are, Neil. You right. are a faster. Well, sir, you have elevated yourself to. Yeah. You know, I mean that. There are people that fast for that reason, right? And yes. that is their reward. Your reward is being recognized by others. Yeah, and you it's know. it's weird. It's it's, and I have felt convicted about this too. Like I I understand Neil's heart in saying yeah. like, oh, I guess I'm not fasting, <laughs> and, you know, in private if I'm announcing this ministry. But I've also been in the middle of fasts, and we live in a culture where everybody's constantly trying to feed you or constantly trying to eat oh, with you. Yeah. And if you're fasting, you are going to have to, unless you live under a rock, yeah. you are going to have to tell somebody, right. no, thank you. Yeah. And they're going to go, you're a weirdo. Why don't you want to eat? And then you have to say, I'm fasting. That's not bragging. No. That's that's not not fasting in private. Um, and then also, kind of in the same vein of what Neil's talking about here, I think it's totally appropriate to get together with some of your Christian brothers and fast together for something yeah, expectantly, things, yeah. um, which is what uh, it's one of the things that Neil said is, uh, should we fast expectantly for God to move at winter retreat? Because Neil and I will be at this winter retreat together. And I say, yes, sir. Let's do it. Let's do it, man. Yeah. yeah. And that's that. That's a good practice to do together, you know, really. And, and especially having someone that you're doing it with, uh, what I've, what I've noticed is it does make a difference because you can encourage each other. You can spur one another on. And, yeah. and that's, that's important. That's good. Yep. Uh, we, we don't, uh, you know, the Bible does not say don't do that. In fact, it encourages us to pray and fast together. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, uh, we're kind of running against the clock here a bit. Um, you know, I guess just hitting on, you know, maybe hope and, uh, I'm fine with going yeah, as long I, as we I, have to I don't go. care either. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, what I love, you know, this passage specifically as it speaks about hope, um, it talks about, uh, Jesus being presented at the temple, right? And that's down in verse 22, uh, and and really, you know, as Jesus went to the temple, there was a man that was there that was waiting for the hope, right? Uh, yeah. um, and, and verse 25 says, There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, which we've talked about, which was the, you know, circumcision. Yep. <laughs> uh, he took it upon, uh, he took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. That's a hope. This man had a hope and his hope was always Jesus. His hope was always the Messiah. And that was the hope that, that mm -hmm. the world had ever since the fall, is that God promised that even though, you know, from Mary, her offspring, you know, would be crushed, uh, you know, that, that, or that her offspring would crush the serpent, mm -hmm. that his heel would be bruised, like that is what the promise was. And, and the hope that, that we have, you know, now as we look back to the cross, our hope is that the work is finished. When yeah. Christ said it is finished, it is finished. You know, these people, like you said, were living in, in kind of dark days for like 400 years, right? The prophets hadn't spoken to them. Their hands are up in the air saying, you know, Lord, where are you, right? And sometimes we find ourselves in similar place, right, Mike, where it's like, dude, really? 
like, come Lord Jesus, right? Like, even so, come. This world is broken. There's so yeah. much division. There's so much hatred. There's so much destruction. And talk of even more destruction. There's disease. There's sickness. There's famine. There's weird weather. Like, it's December and we're having hurricane winds. Like, there's yeah. weirdness happening, right? Like, where are you, Lord? And right? there's smugness. There's smugness, uh, and yeah. And I just want the Lord to come and humble yeah. all of us. Man, it's even if I'm a, I'm going to be a casualty of that, and I hope so, because right. it will be a good thing. But what is our hope, right? Yeah. I mean, we've had this conversation, even, you know, man to man, as we as we are accountable and, and struggling with various things in our lives, right? Whether it's our relationship or even our personal walk or our personal sins, right? Like, there's days where it's just like, Lord, ah, oh, I just... I want some hope. I, I, yep. you know, this world is grieving for hope yes. and, and we're, we're looking in it in, in so many ways, right? Like for the last four years, the hope was, gosh, you know, at least in 2020, we get a new president for a lot of people, right? And their hope was placed in politics or their hope was placed in, well, just the vaccine. Once we have a vaccine, we can get back to normal and, and life will go on like it was before, right? Yeah. How did that hope pan out? Yeah. And really, the only reason I say that is because when you put your hope in anything right. earthly, yes, anything, yes, you will be let down right, every single time. And Simeon's hope. And his trust, we know he trusted, right? Because he was at the temple. He was waiting there. He had, he had waited. God had made a promise to him. Mm -hmm. And instead of, you know, laying and wallowing in misery because this promise never came true, he always waited with hopeful expectation that God would be faithful. And that's what, that's the message, right? Yeah. That's the message of hope is that all these things that we chase, we chase them literally with the kind of hope that's cross your fingers. Uh, let's hope this works out, right? That's not what real right. hope is, oh, right? Man, how many times in the Bible do we need to hear stories of people having to wait long periods of time <laughs> for for God to to do what He says He's going to do, right? How many stories have to be in the Bible? Because there are a lot of them. Yeah, you know where God says, "I am going to do this." I mean, you think about Abraham, right? Right. Uh, God says, I will make many nations of you. And he's like, I don't know, man, I'm getting kind of old. Maybe what he was saying <laughs> is I should sleep with uh, our friend. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. man. So, yeah, I mean, the Bible is cons consistent in so many ways that just, I feel like y you don't know unless you spend the time to right. learn. Yeah. You know, so I just, I see those crossovers into this man who was waiting expectantly for, sure. for for the Lord Jesus to come. And he believed his faith was strong. Yep. And and the you know the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit being on him and really, you know, that that whenever I read that, you know, before Pentecost really, I always get excited, right? Because we now live past that, right? We we live at a time where Jesus ascended into heaven and said, "Don't don't be troubled that I'm leaving you because I'm sending you something that's far better," right? Yeah. And we have that Holy Spirit, right? If 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 our hope and our trust and our faith is in Christ as Christians, we have that Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. Are we listening to his voice? On the days where we feel hopeless, on the days where all seems lost, on the days where it seems like life is just too much to carry and too much to, too, the burdens are too big for us. Are we listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit? Are we even trying to? Or are we too busy wallowing in our own self-pity and forgetting that we have a hope? We have a promise. God has told us that he who began a good work in you sinner will see that work completed you know on the day of jesus christ he will bring us to a place of completion he he is sanctifying us so even as we walk in hopelessness like lord am i ever going to be able to get rid of this sin or am i ever going to be able to break the bondage of my past hurts or my past hang-ups right or my addictions or whatever the case may be are we living as people of hope are we living with that hopeful expectation that God has made a promise to us. That's my encouragement. Be hopeful. Because guess what? The Bible tells us in, in 1 Peter that we are supposed to be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have. Yes. But guess what? If we're living as hopeless people, people are not going to ask us, 
about the hope that we have. People are only going to ask us about the hope we have if we are living as hopeful people. That's right. Even in the midst of dire circumstances, maybe even especially in the midst of dire yeah. circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was just put on my heart while you were talking about that stuff. Um, you said, let's not wallow around in self-pity. And I just wanted to add some clarification from a gospel perspective or from a scriptural perspective more so. Um, and it's from a book that you actually recommended to me. So um, we are told by the Apostle Paul that there are two kinds of grief, right? So this is in 2 Corinthians. Do you mind if I just read no, this really go quick? No, for it, yeah. So it's 2 Corinthians 7, um, 9 through, well, actually it's more like 8 through 11. And it says, for even if I made you grieve, and this is his letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, it says, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter grieved you, though not, or though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. And the reason I think that that's so important is because we don't want to just give you a message of don't wall around in self-pity. We want to give you the full message yeah. of here's what exists for you instead. Yes. Because if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling down, if you're fe feeling a lack of motivation, it's likely because you're feeling a worldly grief and you are literally not spending enough time with the Lord. You're not going to him in prayer. Right. You're not confessing your sins to the Lord. And you're probably also not confessing your sins to your brothers. Right. Yeah. Um, and just speaking in my life, being convicted the way I am about certain sins, um, it makes a world of difference. Yeah. You know, but the consistency is really what's important there. So. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, that's a great word, Mike. And I think, again, like, that that's one thing that Christianity has to offer. That's why it's good news, right? It's good news of yeah. great joy for all people because we have something that we actually can put on instead, right? Like, the Bible is full of you know, messages where it says, you know, put this off, put this off, put this off, put this off. Right. But a lot of other religions, what they have is like, you know, just that checklist. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Here's the hundred rules that you have to live by. And once you live by these rules, you're going to be happy. Right. Right. But Christianity says, don't do these things, but instead do these things because these things always have been here for your delight. They've always yep. been here for your joy. God is for our joy, right? Yes. And it's not about rules. It's not about doing things the right way. It's about uh, obedience to a king who offers nothing, nothing but love and joy and a better way. And, and, the rejection of God's way is what led to despair. The right. rejection of God's way and God's rules is what led to the downfall of humanity and still does today. Yeah. The invitation and the hope that we have is that if we turn to Christ, if we repent, if we walk in newness of life in the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be joyful. We will receive blessing. We will receive what God had always intended for us in the first place. Yeah. And and there's nothing that offers that. There's right. no hope of this world that even comes close to being able to offer that. Right. And that's that's why the question of why do bad things happen to good people <laughs> like really doesn't make any sense. Right. Because unless you are really following the law to a T. Right. Right. Um as under the new covenant. Right. Um, unless you are doing that, you will not be free from the woes of this world. No. Yeah. You know, or even if you're like Job and you're, <laughs> you know, and you're like blameless, you may still also yeah. experience afflictions because God has a lesson that needs to be learned. Right. Your blessing is promised in heaven. So that's that's important. 
but I, you know, I just, I hear a lot of this stuff and I'm just, I'm thinking about all of the arguments I used to have and yeah. all of the arguments that I've come up to and, well, why do bad things happen to good people? It's like, well, you know, I, I'm a Christian. I believe in the total depravity of man. I'm a Calvinist, yeah. you yeah. know, I don't like, and this is a tough one. I got into this discussion with my mom one time. I'm like, mom, what makes you think you're a good person? It's like, uh oh, <laughs> like <laughs> even Jesus said, there's no one good but God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you calling your mom a bad person? I'm not saying she's a bad person. I hope this wasn't on her birthday. <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> think it was. Just to stick her even harder. No, no, no. no. But uh, I mean, we can't, we can't spare. I mean, when when we're giving a gospel message, sometimes it's going to hurt people's feelings. Yeah. Um, my intention certainly wasn't to hurt my mom's feelings, but my intention was to uh, to hopefully communicate. That, that we should be humble before the Lord right. and we should not be calling ourselves good, good because the whole point is that we are not good right. and that we need the Holy Spirit to transform us yep. into the goodness that is... Je- I mean, the only way that we can stand before the Lord is through the goodness of Jesus Christ. Yep. Um, it's, it's not us that God is going to see. It's Jesus that's going to see. You, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. if it was us, we wouldn't be let in. <laughs> Nope. Yeah. So. If it, if it, I mean, if if our salvation depended on our ability to hold on to it, uh, we wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. If if we know anything about about uh, ourselves, which we should, um, you know, uh, shifting gears towards love, Mike. Um, you know, th- this one, I I think is um is probably the one we know, right? God's judgmental. There's a reason we have that t-shirt, right? Yeah. And that's because I think the world really misunderstands what love is. Yeah. But one thing that is just so clear, one thing that is so clear in in Christ coming to earth is that God loves us. You know, John 3:16, probably one of the most famous verses, right? For God yeah. so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever yep. believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How do we know God loves us, Mike? He's, well, he gave his son. Yeah. So knowing that we are sinners, knowing that we are hopelessly depraved, mm-hmm. and he has set this law in place that he knows we will never be able to live up to, right? Because we are fallen, yep. not because he created us imperfect, but because we chose to rebel. He still gave us an opportunity to experience eternity with him Mm -hmm. and to wipe the slate clean. Not because we are good, right? but because he loves us so much and because he's so merciful. And he's faithful to his promise. And he's, he's sparing us the judgment that is rightly supposed to come upon us through the sacrifice of the purely innocent blood of Jesus. Yep. Yep. That's true love. Absolutely. And without without that fear of judgment, without that law, what does it mean? Yeah. Uh, nothing, right? Yeah. Right. And and I think that that, you know, we know John 3:16, right? We know that yep. verse. We see the sign at at the Super Bowl and all the big games. But, <laughs> you know, verses 17 through uh 21 go on to say God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And now why why didn't God send his son into the world con- to condemn the world cuz the world was already condemned, oh, right? Oh yeah. Uh, verse 18 goes on to say, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Yeah. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Amen. Yeah, this should not be a controversial point. It shouldn't be. Unfortunately, people stop reading at the end of verse 16 a lot of the times because... They're like, well, this God is, loves me. Yeah, this is the one. And it's like, yes, God does love you. 
and he loves you so much that he's given you a list of all of these reasons why you deserve to go to hell. Right. You know, so that you can study them and understand what you deserve. I am condemned. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that you can turn to Christ and say, Lord God, hallelujah. You are amazing, God. You are so merciful. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's all we can do is yes. spend our time in Thanksgiving knowing knowing what we deserve. Right. I mean, man, like sometimes I'm like, I'm like just in awe. I'm like, because I know what goes on in my right. head. I know what I've done, you know, and uh, and when you I don't un- deserve it. Right. And and when when you understand that you are already condemned, Mike, and someone sets you free from that condemnation, yep. what is what is the natural response in that? Gratitude. Right. And and if the response isn't gratitude, then you probably really don't understand what you've been set free from, right? Yeah. Because there's times where, you know, even my kids, right? And and I, I won't throw them under the bus specifically, right? But let's say they get a discipline for a choice that they made, right? Mm-hmm. And and you know, let's say the discipline is, you know, go sit and go sit and time out and then come back when when you're ready, right? And we talk through, hey, why did you have this discipline, right? And no, oh, it's because I did this and I did that. Okay, you know, God's good, God forgives, dad loves you, dad forgives. Now don't don't go do it again. And a minute later they're back in the same business, right? Yep. Do they really understand? You know, do they they may understand that that what they did was wrong, but do they really understand grace? Do they really understand mercy? Do they really understand forgiveness yeah. if their choice is just to go back there and do the same thing again? The answer is no, they don't. They don't. They're yeah. choosing sin because sin is what they desire, right? And yeah. and that that's what it talks about, right? Is that you know, judgment, God's judgment is that the light has come into the world. Jesus is the light, okay? So God's judgment, or this is judgment, that Jesus, okay, I'm going to replace light with Jesus. Jesus has come into the world, and the people loved sin rather than Jesus because their works were evil. Yeah. That is what that verse is saying. Yeah. If you choose sin over Christ, it's because you love sin more than you love Christ. Yeah, and this is any sin. Right. Right. Man, the fact that we are not struck, like stricken dead the moment we first sin is evidence of how merciful and grace-filled our God is because the wages of sin are death, death, right? And that's what we deserve when we sin. And that's why we see in the Old Testament people sinning, like what we what we would even today consider like mundane sins, like God would brutally punish these people right up to death a lot of the time and yeah <laughs> i mean like, if, if you diso i mean i mean this this is an example i'm just trying to give an example yeah. of what you're saying if you if you disobey your parents habitually as a child after a while the law of the lord said that you would be stoned to death right and not only would you be stoned to death but your parents would be required to throw the first stones at their own child yeah. Right. Because God cares about sin. It, it right. matters. So how I mean, and this is a really difficult concept for a child to understand. How do you understand what mercy looks like if you don't first understand that, like, you deserve death for your sin? Right. You know, and that it's brutal, man. It's yeah. brutal. But that it shows just how graceful and merciful and loving the Lord truly is. Because we don't even really, I I feel like even myself, like I don't even really truly understand that when I'm choosing to sin against the Lord, I'm I'm giving myself a death sentence. Yeah, you're. I give, don't truly understand that. Right. And, and I don't think a lot of us really do. No, and and we also don't want to look at it in the way that John presents it here is that we the reason that we habitually choose sin is or is because we love evil more than we love Jesus right yeah. and that that's the part i think that a lot of people struggle with is that god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son right we know what god did because he loved us what is the evidence that we love god because if you examine us based on the the our, our lifestyle right a lot of christians who claim christ right 
they are choosing evil over Jesus. Yeah. And and I, again, I'm saying this as a man who knows I stand before the Lord guilty and only by Christ's blood and sacrifice uh, could I ever, you know, uh, walk in newness of life. I know that I need Jesus, right? But But the point is we're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And this is one of those passages where we have to do that. Yes. Am I choosing evil? Am I choosing to love evil? Or am I choosing to love Jesus? And if the answer is I'm choosing to love evil, repent, turn to Christ, love him instead, pray fast, Fast. do do these things, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't just live by John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. That is true, but it's true in light of verses 17 through 21 as well. Mm -hmm. And so... The appeal here is yes and amen, God loves us. Yes and amen, it is good news of great joy for all people. Yes, there is peace on whom his favor rests. Yes, but please don't be flippant about that. If you are a professing Christian, examine your life. What evidence do you have in your life that you are walking in the light instead of walking in darkness? But don't, if you, if you come to a place where you are overwhelmed by the reality that you're walking in darkness, understand that the angels burst forth in darkness with the good news of the gospel of mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Turn to him. Mm-hmm. Run to your Savior. There is freedom there. Yep. That's yeah. my message. And one of the best ways in my experience to run to the Savior is to go to your Christian brothers mm-hmm. and and to confess your sins. Um, help them to hold you accountable. Uh, that's a great way in my experience. What I'm learning is it's a great way to learn how to let the Lord hold you accountable because the Holy Spirit will move in your Christian brothers and sisters, brothers, if men go to men, you know? Yeah. Um, but also your your spiritual uh, leaders and guides, um, the Holy Spirit will move in them to hold you accountable as well. And that's that's one way that God chooses to move through, it is through other people. So um, functionally, right? Like that's what I'm trying to talk about mm-hmm. is, is functionally, how do we slay our demons? How do we, how do we turn to the Lord? You know, how do we, how do we win this spiritual battle? And we have to be strong readers of the Bible. We have to be strong pray, uh, prayer warriors. We have to be strong uh, men holding each other accountable. Uh, iron sharpens iron, right? Like these are all the things that we have to do, but we also have to do them faithfully. Mm-hmm. And we will do them as a result of a change in heart. And if you don't feel that, pray for it. Right. You know, like that's the hard part for me right now is like, I don't feel like praying a lot of the time. I don't feel like reading the word, but I'll tell you what, if I can just get over that hump of not wanting to do it, or even just letting the, the like lack of want to, to be the signal that that's what I need to do. Right. Man, like I'm, I haven't developed that habit, but I'm like trying to, and I know that it is possible. And I know that it'll pay serious dividends, you know, so. And, and you know, I, I, I agree with you. It's kind of like working out, right? Like yeah. there's a lot of times where you don't want to wake up early and work out, but but the fact that you don't want to is more evidence that you probably ought to, to, right? Because, yep. I mean, you the reason that you don't want to is probably just, you know, laziness, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, again, we're looking for a quick fix. That That's what our, you know, that's what, comes natural to us you know yep. every in our, in our fallen nature yeah everything about christianity is counterintuitive yes you know it's that's the point is that <laughs> you know that's it, the it, point yeah, is it, that it it is not from our hearts right it is not from our depravity that uh that christianity was built it was out of the perfection of the perfect righteous creator of everything yep Amen. Despite our weaknesses. Absolutely. And so, you know, 
I, I think the final appeal, you know, we tried to make an appeal there to, to Christians, professing Christians, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the final appeal that we would also have is don't waste the opportunities. Christmas is coming. This is a season uh, with open gospel doors. Uh, you know, we're going to exchange gifts in a lot of facets, you know, family, friends, whatever yeah. the case may be, right? But the greatest gift that God ever gave humanity was himself. And so that also is the greatest gift that we can pass on to our family and to our friends uh, this Christmas season. Um, and there's no better time than right now. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and again, if you ask me that same question, I'll tell you, there's no better time than right now. Right now, the opportunity exists. There's no guarantee that the opportunity is going to exist tomorrow, next week, you know, whatever the case may be. So yep. make the best use of the time that we still have right now because Jesus is coming back. Mm -hmm. And so please, 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 for those that are afraid to share the gospel with their family, start simple. Just ask a simple question. You know, uh, you don't have to have some elaborate plan to try and share the gospel. Sometimes you just need to take advantage of the doors that are already open for you yeah. and just try and have a spiritual conversation. You know, in Mike's case, right? Like he's he's singing at church, right? You can make it a family thing. Like, hey, come see the family, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's a simple way to open a door of gospel opportunity. Um, for your friends, uh, even those who you've had, uh, conversations with Jesus about, like, don't make assumptions. There's yeah. a lot of people that profess Christ that don't know him. And so press in, don't just make the assumption that because someone says that they're a Christian or because someone says that they love Jesus, that they actually really understand the gospel. Right. Now, I'm not telling you to go and play 20 questions and, and make sure that yeah. they're really saved. I'm saying don't treat them as if they are when you don't really know if they are. Have an intentional conversation with them and share the gospel. We need it. Yep. Mike, Share the gospel with me. I need it every single day. We need yep. the gospel. So don't feel foolish as if you're sharing something that someone already knows. We all need the gospel every single day. Yeah. And, and it's, and don't be proud. Yeah. Because especially during this season, if like, if you have family traditions that get in the way of actually being a part of the church body and worshiping, you might need to change those yeah. habits. You might need to take an L and, uh, you know, be be the leader and decide, no, we are going to prioritize being part of the church body. We are going to prioritize um, going to church and we're going to prioritize bringing our family to church with us so that they can hear the gospel message. Uh, you have an obligation to be that spiritual leader that makes those changes to to put your family in the best position possible to to learn the truth. Right. You have that obligation and you have that authority. Right. And I consider myself a decent gift giver, right? I try to know people and 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 then, you know, get a gift that I think is going to hit home and and you did for us, right? I we we still think about that uh, you know, that uh aqua garden that you oh, got the us. Arrow like, garden. Yeah, we've used that thing like so much and it's it's but that gift will burn this side of heaven. <laughs> It, we don't get to bring that with us. Yeah, that's true. So just remember, e when you're thinking about gifts, when you're thinking about even how you sign your Christmas cards or what your Christmas cards are even going to say, like, don't miss opportunities to share Jesus with your family. The greatest gift that you can give anyone in this world is Jesus Christ and ensuring that you did your best to make sure they understood there is good news of great joy for all the peoples that Christ has come. There is hope. There is joy. There is love. There is peace for this world. Share that news and, and take advantage of the opportunities that are given to us. Uh, we love you pilgrims. Um, we want nothing but the best for you. I don't know if we're going to po podcast next week or not. It'll be the 23rd. So we'll have to make that decision. But if we don't, Merry Christmas to you guys. We're so thankful for you. Uh, you know, share this podcast. Even if this podcast is your way of having that spiritual conversation with somebody or the open door, like use us. Like that's what we're here for. 
you know, if you were touched by this podcast and you want to use us as, as the mechanism to, to start that spiritual conversation with your family, do it. Uh, we'd love that. And, uh, you know, share us. We have no problem with that. Right, Mike? Right. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, give us a shout out, buddy. Remember that there's a perishing world out there. So we need to do our best to ensure that they're hearing the truth. God bless you, pilgrims. And stay pugnacious. <laughs> stay pugnacious. <laughs>